This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. And the program that you're watching is Human Humane Architecture. I am DeSoto Brown, the co-host of this program, and I am the archivist at Bishop Museum. And joining us via audio from Germany, where he currently is, is the host of this program, who is Martin Despain. Good day to you, Martin. It's morning for you. It's afternoon for us here. Hello, DeSoto, and hello, listeners. Hello, everyone. And, and viewers. Happy <laughs> viewers, happy listeners. And today we're talking about a place in Waikiki, which is called the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center. And do you, should we go to our first picture, do you think? We should do, because that's our little tradition where there we, we see our very uh, stylishly zeitgeist, the eyewitnessing DeSoto looking at the construction site, right? That's right. This is 1978. The Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center is under construction. I am showing my displeasure on my face by the noise because of the noise and the dust and I do want to say too that just about a year after this picture was taken when the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center was partly constructed there was a sniper one afternoon who shot people on Kalakaua Avenue right in front of where I'm standing in this picture and he wounded five people but fortunately did not kill anyone but that's not what we're going to get into we're going to talk about the architecture of the Royal Hawaiian Center and uh, let's go to our next picture yeah, and I guess that's what, like, 23 years prior to that construction, right? That's Correct. how it looked before. Correct. This is about 1955, and this is Kalakaua Avenue, the sidewalk, and to the left in this picture is the site of what became the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center. And originally, this was all the gardens and the grounds of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and you can see the Royal Hawaiian in the lower left corner of this uh, slide that we're showing right now. And when that was constructed in 1927, it was built as the most luxurious hotel in the Hawaiian Islands, surrounded by beautiful gardens, and that's what you can see right here, because those gardens continued up until 1960, from 1950 to 1960, part of those gardens were replaced. And if we go to our mm -hmm. next picture, we will and, and see... And to me, from half around the world, that looks very exotically um, jungly, you know, yes. paradisal. Yes, that's right, that's right. And we can see in the next picture, which is from 1963, that those gardens, at least along the street, have been replaced by a series of four commercial buildings. Now, the jungle isn't there anymore, but there still are a lot of palm trees, and it is, uh, however, a different feeling because it's now a retail district. It's now a strip of retail stores. And if we go to our next picture, this is the same sort of strip in 1965, and this is the first building that was built along that, that stretch of Kalakaua that was uh, the oldest building, was the um, Royal Block, and it was a series of retail spaces. Then it was followed by the McInerney Department Store, the Royal Hawaiian Arcade, and the Snack Shop Restaurant. And they were all there until 1978 in our next picture. And that's exactly. when... And you see the construction side in the background, and you yeah. told me that the, the building would look uh, in front of us as an Ossipoff building, or was an Ossipoff building, Correct. right? It's the only remnant of the McInerney store, which they used as their construction office during the construction of the initial part of the Royal Wine Shopping Center. And then they eventually destroyed that as well for the entire shopping complex that we're talking about today. And next... Here's another picture from 1978, and again, that construction is starting, but on the left is one of the remaining buildings that I was just talking about. That's the Royal Hawaiian Arcade, which was a wooden building, and it was demolished last as they gradually worked their way from Lewer Street in the Diamond Head direction to construct the entire Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center. And the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, in our next slide, is in a style that's called brutalism. And Martin, tell us about brutalism. Well, we, we choose to pull from Wikipedia here, which is like the explanation for the people here. And it talks about brutalism, uh, not what it sounds like being brutal. That's how it was perceived later on. We're going to get to that. That's when people dismiss the style. But originally, it comes from the French term for raw concrete beton bleu, and Le Corbusier is one of the most important uh, architects of the 20th century, 
was heavily getting into that one as well. And this is a building here in the United States, the New York Buffalo City Court building, which shows in its very extreme that these buildings were intentionally very, very uh, hermetic. They were very, very windowless. And they mostly uh, sort of turned their uh, their their open uh, face to the to the inside, and so it was a style that was very very much of its time. Before that, as you just pointed out, with the pictures from the 50s and the 60s in uh, on Kalkau Avenue, uh, everything was very lean and streamlined and um, and open and modern, high modern. Uh, and in the 70s, it turned to this sort of more um, uh, ethereal, uh, very uh, uh, gravity-based, very grounded, very massive kind of architecture. Right. And um, if we go to the next picture, this is surprise, surprise. This is how uh, the architects in that era sort of themed, as one would call it today, the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, right. as I subtitled this as the Rocks and the Jungle. Yes, this looks like you know a, a natural formation um, out of minerals, uh, basically uh, um, aligned with uh, this lush tropical vegetation. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, I tr I hope people could see in one of the previous pictures is that the Royal Block initially was extremely open as a modern building. The glass frontages, every one of those uh, retail spaces was entirely fronted by glass. And once the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center was built, it went in the entirely other direction to be a windowless, pretty much, facade of raw concrete. Mm -hmm. And there's the However, Mercedes. However, if we go to the next picture, if you look up closer, there were certain glimpses, yes. sort of, you know, certain views, frame views that gave you an indication of inhabitation. And you pointed out, for example, these kind of very 70-ish uh, uh, external elevators it had these uh, light bulbs at the top and at the bottom, <laughs> and you can see that cabin moving up and down. Yes. But to the right and to the left, you see this very intentionally, very hermetic, very closed uh, concrete surface. Right. And the next picture gets us an up-close view that you kindly provided again from get, taking us back into the times that right. actually the ground floor indeed was open. It was almost like a sculptor took a, a chiseling tool and, and carved out that monolithic block and, and cut these openings in. And these, right. co these openings were pushed back, so they were in the shade, and they were shaded, and they get kept cool. Because right. we always look at architecture not just in, in its surface, but it's its substance. So you might say maybe that you get a first idea that this approach of architecture was certainly new and maybe foreign to the island. Yes. Might have not been that inappropriate. Uh, uh, climatically thinking, maybe this was an approach uh, worth, worth taking. Correct. And I can also say, too, that you didn't really see those frontages of those businesses unless you were right up close to them. And one of the problems was because there was no signage and because the windows were so hidden that if you look on the right, on the left side of this picture, there's a banner that's hanging up that says Suzanne at the Royal. That's because some of the businesses eventually started putting out banners to show that they were actually located there so that people would see them from across the street. Mm-hmm. And speaking of hidden treasures, what you just what you just said. If you go to the next picture, we can see another feature of the building that you got a you got a glimpse from the outside. Right. And these are these sort of four uh, sort of beams that you can see Im implied on the roof there. Right. And uh, these these beams. If we go to the next picture, this is when you kindly did your photo documentation a couple of weeks ago. This is a picture you took, right? Correct. And that is a tree that was already growing on the property. And before the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center was built, the outdoor circle said that they wanted the developer to save this exceptional tree because it's one of the very few of this tree that are growing in the Hawaiian Islands. And so they kept it. It has thrived. It has grown up through those open rafters that we were just discussing. So it's part of the building in a way that goes up through, as you were saying last night, what could be sort of the ceiling. The rafters or the beams there suggest a ceiling, but in fact it's the sky and the tree has grown up through them. Mm-hmm. 
And the next picture uh, gives us a, a zoom, a close-up of the texture of the concrete. And this is how these beams look like, and this is how the entire structure looked like. And this is also very typical for brutalism that uh, from a distance it looked very sort of o opaque and, and, and flush, but when you got closer, uh, at least some or a significant number of these buildings were treated very delicately by something that you call a bush hammering method. And uh, whereas it looks like this has been manually carved with a tube and almost like the Egyptians or the Aztecs, in fact, we're talking 1970s and 80s, highly industrialized building technology. This was done with a hydraulic tool that was sort of chiseling that out of concrete. So, but nevertheless, it was quite an effort. And what it did, as you can see, it brought out the aggregates and the aggregates are dark. So this is basalt. So th this is this is local uh, petrified stone. You can say that was man-made, right? Yeah, and this is also, as you just said, this is very typical of brutalism: the textured concrete and also the chipped concrete that you were just describing is something that you very frequently see in brutalism. So it looks like it's a smooth surface from a distance, but as you just pointed out, it's actually textured, and there's a lot of hand work that goes into that to make it look like that. Yeah. If we go to the next picture and we step back again and look more at the spatial uh, quality of, of, of the mall, and it's actually not even called a mall, right? The original name and still to these days is Royal Hawaiian Center. Yes. So the center sort of implies maybe also some, some social quality. And in fact, if you look at the, the clever organization, so the main circulation is partly covered. Uh, every storefront has an overhang that we already know from the ward center that we did a show which mm -hmm. is also as we classified it as a as an exotic uh, brutalist uh, uh, structure so same uh, performance and same features but in addition to that uh, the the other half at least or sometimes more is open to the elements and it basically ends with um, the, uh, the the courtyard but the, the threshold between the hallway and the courtyard is uh, naturally the guardrail, so you don't fall off the edge. Uh, but different than in the Alamoana Mall, which we have done the last show about, that had some very uh, tragic press recently because some of these guardrails failed and, and, and led to some unfortunate death uh, and casualties, fatal casualties. Uh, here, the guardrails are way more cleverly designed, and in fact, it's a trough, it's a planter, out of which this very sort of filigree steel guardrail seems to grow out of, and then it's tilted inwards, which is really about the safest way you can design a, a, a guardrail in a public space, because people then sort of try to climb over it, and they fall on their back. So this is a very, very sophisticated solution. And a lot of myself, being a practicing architect, if you want to try this with any kind of client, especially profit-driven developers, good luck because this is really, this is high standard and this is really nicely designed, neatly, neatly done. Yeah, and you know what else we've talked about too? We, we say that the Royal Hawaiian Center has a very blank, featureless facade that it, pretend, that it presents to the, to the outside world and yet it turns inward because the interior is where the vitality is, is where you're expected to go. That's where they want you to go rather than just walk along and look from the street. They want you to come inside and experience what we're seeing in these pictures right here. Exactly, and that today is not the case anymore. And now we're gonna look a little yeah. closer, why not? And the next picture just shows us how it looks today. Correct. Um, and uh, maybe we jump over that picture because people probably know it and if not, they can go there. But I think more importantly is the next picture that we sort of collaged as sort of a way to try to understand. So if you go back to the time and you see which, you know, which president ran the, the United States at that time when the shopping center was, was built, it was Jimmy Carter. And, uh, you know, Carter is, with all respect, and he gets a lot more rehabilitation now these days than during his presidency, it was really about substance and, and, and ethics and, and, and reality. And then, you know, ever since uh, Ronald Reagan took over, it, it shifted from substance to surface. And that's what the, what the center is representing at the very picture at the bottom right, is that each storefront was sort of like um, throwing its makeup on Mm -hmm. and trying to make a big show 
So it was more about extroverted than introverted, right? Right, right. And all of those things, as you said just, just now, makeup, those are facades that have been put onto that original concrete exterior. So they're not really intrinsically part of the building. They are extraneous. You also had pointed out that they are like cheesecake, meaning uh, a reference to the Cheesecake Factory restaurant. So it's been adorned, it's been decorated, it's had extraneous things put on it that weren't originally there and that was to modernize it, to make it more appealing, and also uh, things go out of fashion and brutalism is not particularly in fashion and so we've got these extraneous exteriors now. Yeah, and if we go to the next slide, the owner reveals what you just said. Yeah. Almost like sitting on the red couch and telling the <laughs> psychotherapist what right. the problem is. And here, the, the client shares, the owner shares his paranoia his his phobia about about brutalism you know right. i mean they they respectfully call it a minimal minimalist style but then they very quickly get into their criticism and and basically explain that it was anti-commercial you know what you explained right. is that there was the sort of hidden secret and you were supposed to go inside they were saying well that doesn't work right. people don't find us people don't see us so that's why they started to, I mean, I call it cheesecaking it because one of the tenants is Cheesecake Factory. And that is the one, the most appalling piece, I think, that so this disrespectfully just throws the stucco and plaster at that very refined and, and delicately crafted um, uh, bush hammered surface. Right. And um, so that being said, if we go to the next picture, that illustrates that, right? Right. We've got a contrast here of the original raw concrete with some other elements that have been added since then to dress it up, make it look more sleek, make it look more modernistic. So there's the wood slatted roof, the interior ceiling, I should say. And then these beams have been smoothed over with kind of a stucco plaster exterior put over them so that it's not so lump, it's not so much the raw concrete that it used to be, but it's got these extra elements to make it smoother more appealing, more attractive, more modern looking, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a, a very recent phase of remodeling that took like, I think almost like over a year. And if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, we, we can see that. So this is what they, you know, probably correctly call the Royal Grove, because if you, you know, keep walking through, you, you end up at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. So they sort of reactivated and reanimated that um, that that space, which is probably to be uh, complimented and yes. and applauded. Um, however, again, I allow myself to quote again another phrase of from their website, where you know in the in the white text they talk about you know the grove and you know the connection and the connectivity. Uh, but then the sentence concludes with this room that they're sort of introducing, and then they, they basically say it's an air-conditioned space where visitors can see three films on Hawaiian culture and history. And I, I think it's fair to say that we were both a little bit puzzled, to say the least, about that sort of combination uh, that, uh, you know, you want to show history, you want to show legacy, you want to show tradition, but then again, what does air conditioning have to do with Hawaiian tradition? Uh, little to nothing, and we both have been there, and we've been critical about other developments actually pretty much across the street, a little further, a Diamond Head side, which is the uh, international marketplace, which we were seeing AstroTurf. And mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, we see the AstroTurf here. We also see we the AstroTurf in the extension of the Ala Moana Mall that we talked about yes. last week. Yes. So AstroTurf seems to be the thing which both of us you know, are a little bit irritated about because that's petroleum-based uh, plastic. Yeah. That just like air conditioning has very little to do with Hawaiian e tradition exactly. and culture. Exactly, and and the term I used last night was to illusionize this area to make it look. I mean, it is very appealing, it is very attractive, but at the same time, it is creating some illusions because it's not 100% natural. Even though you are under a gigantic banyan tree and surrounded by palms, there is still. Uh, there are elements of petroleum-based products in there, and we can't get away from that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the term illusionized, ever since you said that last night, that's one of my new favorite terms. <laughs> I uh, will adopt that. All right, good. <laughs> And um, if we go to the next slide, uh, it reminded me of a project um, we've been doing some now 20 years ago, and we in fact did a show about it a while ago in the old uh, Urban Transcendent Show days at the very bottom right, so people can look at that. And it's a kindergarten, and we took the same approach of basically making the facade a non-facade, like more a retaining wall, and cut very few strategically placed openings, which you can see behind that woman who was walking out of the, the kindergarten. But then there's one major larger opening, which is basically the entrance to the kindergarten, and it leads to a courtyard. And then the pic pic picture on the left is pretty much the circulation, so very similar to the Royal Hawaiian, where basically the aha effect is on the inside, whereas the outside you know, um, is is strategically and intentionally more um, more austere. And uh, one thing that the director in, in, the, in the show says is that the, the parents come and they're excited to bring their kid to that new kindergarten. And then they're very um, surprised that this is almost two decades old. Right. So, um, but, but the main thing I want to point out is, is when we talk about natural environment and typology, we, uh, both projects strategically introduced the courtyard as a theme for uh, wayfinding and, uh, and procession through space, but as well as a climatic control device, as a natural climatic control device, because the Mediterranean culture of the ancient times, as the Greek and the Romans, that was their air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Their natural air conditioning was the courtyard. So the Royal Hawaiian Center, using that uh, typology of courtyards, is in fact uh, a principally very appropriate way of, of climate control because right. that whole thing doesn't have big glass fronts and it has large overhangs and it has these courtyards with lush vegetation and we got evaporative cooling. Right. So the whole thing is pretty green in, in literally and figuratively speaking, right? Yes, and you're keeping out a lot of heat through uh, the various exteriors. I mean, we had a discussion last night, does concrete retain heat or is it an insulation from heat? And mm -hmm. that, uh, I am not an engineer to be able to tell you, but I would say that a thick concrete wall is going to take a long time to heat up to the point where it's going to be heating the interior. And I would say that a thick concrete exterior is going to be something that's going to keep the inside cooler. And that's the way the mm -hmm. Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center looks. Absolutely. And, you know, going to towards the end of the show, uh, if we go to the next picture, um, we want to point out that there is some renaissance of brutalism. There is an awareness. This is a website called City Lab. And it's the case for, you know, making a case for brutalism again. This is one of the most, you know, known brutalist buildings in Boston. Um, and uh, at the very bottom right is a picture I took when I was there. And I think you also quoted the term heroic, right? Yeah. The term heroic is often used in association with, with a brutalist style. Yes. And so if we, go, if we go to the next picture, this is actually a picture you took just a couple of weeks ago, which right. shows actually a corner, the situation where little has been altered. This is right. pretty much still the original. Um, you, can, you can see this sort of strategy of creating the solid that you basically carve out. Yes. So voiding the solid is, you can, you can call this architectural strategy. And the next picture is us um, also many years ago with one of our first projects here, which are these train stations. And they have a similar approach as well. They are rather closed from the outside to give you protection and shelter from the traffic. But on the platform, they, they open up and they're carved out for different functions. So um, also the materiality is, uh, by the way, basalt, so lava, but not uh, Hawaiian. That would have been too far to ship it from. But this is, we have some volcanic areas in Germany. So this is from the Eiffel. So this is Eiffel, uh, Eiffel basalt. And, you know, little did I know that I would ever uh, end up in Hawaii and you did some pretty interesting research because we, first of all, and we can also say uh, already that we're going to, we get so excited about exotic brutalism that it, we can't get it out of our minds. So right. that will lead to our next show being right. entirely dedicated to that subject. Right. 
but you already went ahead to think about that maybe there are some traces uh, yeah. of indigenous uh, nature sure. on the Hawaiian Islands right. about uh, using building materials more stereotomically, more massively, and more monolithically rather than uh, skeletally and tectonically. And that right. is the next picture. What is that project? Is well, this is, this is a heiau, which is located on the island of Molokai. This is a photograph from 1909. And if you see the man at the bottom of this huge wall, you can see the size of it. Now, this is a religious structure. This is not something where people lived. But it does have a monolithic quality, even though it's made up of a lot of individual rocks, which are clearly visible. And yet the size and the scope and the mass of this thing is really not that dissimilar from the ideals of brutalism. So while it is kind of a stretch to say this is brutalism of hundreds of years ago, it's not that far off because we are in fact using the same types of materials, basalt, and we are massing it in the same way to give a similar type of feeling of solidity, heroic is, heroicness, um, not unlike brutalism does. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And if we go to the next picture, we can even, you might even go that far to call it timeless because this could be in Hawaii, right? We yeah. see some volcanic mountains in the back. We see some palm trees and we see sort of a brutalist architecture, a bush hammered if you look at the detail. This looks like Ward Plaza. This looks like the interior courtyard of our today's project, the Royal Hawaiian Center. But it is actually on another volcanic island, the island of Tenerife, which belongs to the Canarian Islands. And it's by local architects, but it's a, it's a contemporary project that has just been built. And that shows this sort of the reappreciation of a younger generation of architects for that style that had been very, very dismissed. Yes. Uh, over the years. Um, however, also we want to sort of cheerlead a little further. There's also projects from the past that haven't been that dismissed. Yes. And uh, the next picture shows the picture on the right is a detail, very uh, famous detail of the Embacadara Center, Center in San Francisco with his, these ferns uh, in the middle of this sort of uh, liquid stone, how, how Frank Lloyd Wright called, called concrete. This is a brutal structure very heavy, very massive, spanning over several blocks, but yet softened to vegetation. And yes. that is what we see on the left, right? The, yes, the right. cover of the brochure. Right. From uh, which uh, uh, era is, was this that? This is from 1997, and it was a sculpture and a fountain which have been removed by now. But you can see in the background is the original concrete structure of the Royal Hawaiian Center. And then, as we were pointing out, the addition of flora, the addition of growing plants into the concrete setting. And this is something that brutalism often did to have planter boxes which were kind of confining the flora and the confining the growth of the plants to one degree and yet at the same time the plants are still growing in the way that they want to in a totally natural style so you've got the juxtaposition of the built concrete environment softened by and contrasted to the addition of living plants absolutely and coming to the end of the show, the last picture, we've been using cars as vehicles for reflection for a while. And the, the top row of images are some that I took. To the left is in Dresden, a uh, 1950s Mercedes SL that I think it's fair to say that got pimped over the years. And the second picture from the left at the top is a brochure of my friend Stefan, who has relatives who restore vintage cars back to their original status. So looking at the, at the Royal Hawaiian Center, it, it reminds me of uh, my car that I had when I came to the United States and I bought the 72 Plymouth Fury, which you see single at the third from the left on the, on, on the top row. 72 Plymouth Fury, I bought it for $600. And just for the fun, I was just Googling, you know, how much would it be worth today? And believe it or not, the very right picture at the top row, there is one for sale in Hawaii. So guys, go and get it. It's only 12500 bucks. <laughs> and if I do my math right, this is like a 2,000% increase of value. So a very provocative and polemic uh, uh, provocation might be, hey guys, you know, strip all that bullshit off the, uh, the, the, the facade and bring it back to its original, 
which, you know, all things considered, we said, is actually pretty cool. Right. And there is, as we said, the uh, reappreciation for brutalism. Well, that brings us to the end of the program, everybody. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will be back very soon, back with a different schedule when Martin returns from Germany. And this has been Human Humane Architecture on ThinkTech Hawaii. And we will see you in our next episode. Till